Hello and welcome to Pango Pango and American Samoa, the host of Oceania's first football tournament of 2018. My name is Gordon Watson. In this episode of OFC Monthly, we will recap the qualifying stage of the OFC Champions League before turning the spotlight onto the upcoming group stage of the region's premier club football competition. We meet a former national team player from American Samoa who created history in 2011 by becoming the first ever transgendered footballer to play in a World Cup qualifier. We also chat to a rising NFL star who represented his country in a FIFA World Cup qualifier prior to his American football career. And we hear from a New Zealand assistant referee who found himself assisting in a mid-air medical emergency during his journey to the Champions League qualifier. But we kick off at the Pango Pango Soccer Stadium, the venue for the round-robin qualifying stage of the 2018 OFC Champions League. With two qualifying spots up for grabs, the stakes couldn't have been higher for the champions of American Samoa, Cook Islands, Samoa and Tonga all eager to join the other 14 direct entrants in the group stage of the tournament. Cook Islands, Tupapa Marairenga and Lupe Olasonga from Samoa kicked off proceedings on the opening day of the competition. With the majority of the match evenly contested by the two sides, the turning point came when Lupe's Va Tawalai was sent off in the 68th minute. Just five minutes later, the Cook Islanders managed to capitalise on their numerical advantage. Sean Latimer's spot kick was enough for two puppets to grab the points and get their campaign off to the best possible start. The second game between Tonga's club champions Vaitongo and host Pango Pango Youth delivered another close encounter. Tongan Youth International saw a Kai Vea netted from a free kick in the 14th minute, but Vaitongo's celebration was cut short with referee Veer Singh ruling the goal out. Things turned bad to worse for the visitors following Nissan Silao's speculative long-range attempt which was totally misjudged by Motapkiai Faupola in Vaitongo's goal. There is uh, the goalkeeper. Oh dear. Pango's luck ran out when substitute Ruben Luva Jr was sent off for a second bookable offence. Tongans took full advantage in injury time courtesy of skipper Sioni Ubatai. Tupapa Marairanga went into match day two knowing that a win over Vaitonga would secure their first appearance in the OC Champions League group stage since 2001. And it took only 12 minutes for the Cook Islanders to grab the lead through Sean Latimer. The prolific striker doubled his side's advantage 10 minutes later. For a brief moment, it seemed like things were about to change. The referee awarded a penalty for Vaitongo for a foul on Sokai Vea by Ane Fowler inside the box. However, the young striker lost his call and was shown red, and despite Vai Lutu's conversion from the spot, the Tongans were up against it with an, almost an hour of football remaining in the match. Two quick goals at the end of the first half gave Tupapa a 4-1 lead at the break. And the goals kept flowing in the second half as the Cook Islanders put the result well beyond any doubt. Despite Lutu scoring a game from the spot in injury time, Tupapa ended the match with a resounding 9-2 win to secure their spot in the OC Champions League group stage for the first time in 17 years. Well, two wins is, is, is good, to, good to have in the, in, in the bag. Um, one more game to go. You know, we hope that um, we can put a decent team in for the last game and, um, you know, make it a a really good, uh, really good job at the, at the last last hurdle. The day's second match between Pango Youth and Lupe Olasonga was showing plenty of promise. Following the narrow 1-0 defeat in their opener, Lupe showed determination from the outset and broke the deadlock inside the opening 10 minutes through Lapa Lapa Tony. The Samoans scored two more before Roy Ledoux replied on the half-hour mark to keep the host faint hopes alive.
however it wasn't to be, and the onslaught continued with three more Lupe goals before the break. Suavai Atanga followed up his first half hat trick with a brace in the second to finish the match with five goals. The 13 1 final score is the biggest margin to date in the qualifiers, beating Tupapa Marairing as 11 1 win over Pango Youth in 2013. Both Lupe Olasonga and Vaitonga had plenty to play for on the third and final match day. On the back of their 13-1 win over Pango Youth, the Samoans were seen as the most likely contenders to join Tupapa in the group stage. While a draw was enough for Lupe, the Tongans needed a win to leapfrog their rivals in the standings. Following a nervy start to the game, Bird Vainga settled the Samoans' nerves in the 30th minute. Atanga was on target next to continue his prolific goal-scoring form. Vanga scored his second before defender Andrew Setefano's effort gave Lupe a 4-0 lead at the break. In the second half, substitute Darren Alatina Talalai grabbed a brace to help his side to a 6-0 win and secure the Samoans' qualification to the group stage. First of all, to copy the glory for everything he had done for us. It, um, for now, I'm so proud for my boys to make to the second stage, to qualify for the Championship League for the in Solomon. I think it's a really great opportunity, great opportunity for our team to um, participate for this um, second stage. Uh, first of all, thanks for all the supporters that support our team in a different way, even um, American Samoa for good hosting. Thank you for everything. With heavy rain and pango pango, difficult conditions greeted the teams in the final encounter of the competition. After their record defeat to Lupe, Pango Youth was keen to finish the tournament on a high, while Tupapa Marairinga was eyeing their third win from as many matches. Tupapa needed just seven minutes to grab the lead through Maru Bonsumaru before Jeffrey Strickland got in on the action to give a 2 0 first half lead to the table topping Cook Islanders. Bonsumaru and Strickland were again on target in the second half, followed by Sean Latimer's 79th minute effort to secure a 5-0 win. Uh, again, different kind of weather, hard to play in this kind of weather but really pleased with the uh, performance by the team today. Congratulations to qualifier winners Tupapa from the Cook Islands and Samoan runners-up Lupe Olasonga after progressing to the 2018 OC Champions League group stage. Tupapa will travel to Port Vila in Vanuatu to face Group A rivals Lay City, Nalkutan FC and Ba FC between the 10th and 16th of February. Current Papua New Guinea National Soccer League champions Lay City will contest their third consecutive OFC Champions League group stage. Peter Ganemba's men will be hoping to improve on last year's effort when they finished third in their group with one win and two defeats. OFC Champions League debutants Nalkutan FC will fly Vanuatu's flag in Group A. The club from Tana is only the second non-Port Vila based team to qualify for the tournament from Vanuatu. They will be following in the footsteps of last year's qualifiers Malumpa Revivers from Luganville. 2007 runners-up Bar are set for their 10th appearance at the region's top club football competition. Last year, the Fijians failed to progress to the knockout stage after finishing third in their group with a win, a draw and a loss. Group B of the competition is also set to kick off on the 10th of February in Tahiti. 2017 S-League winners Solomon Warriors will compete in their fourth Champions League tournament. In their last appearance in 2016, the Solomon Islanders finished third in their group. AS Dragon will return to regional competition for the first time since 2014. It will be the Tahitian's third continental campaign. 
New Caledonia's AS Lossie will also be eyeing a successful return to the competition following their disappointing 2016 campaign, when they lost all three group matches. Meanwhile, Vanuatu's Ericor Golden Star will be hoping to build on their Champions League experience from last year. In their 2017 debut appearance, the Port Vila-based club finished third in their group with two defeats and a win. Auckland will host Group C of the competition between the 25th of February and the 3rd of March. Host Auckland City FC will again enter the tournament as the team to beat. The regional giants have ruled the OFC Champions League with an iron fist, winning it a record nine times, and seven times in a row since 2011. Latoka FC will be another club eager to make a meaningful return to continental football for the first time since 2011. In their previous two attempts in 2010 and 2011, they finished second and third in their groups respectively. Papua New Guinea's Madang FC made their Champions League debut last year with two defeats and a win to finish third in their group. AS Venus will go into the group stage high on confidence after halting Tahitian powerhouse AS Tefana from making their fourth consecutive appearance at Oceania's international club competition. Venus have twice before represented Tahiti at regional level, including the 1999 and 2001 Oceania Club Championships. And finally, Honiara will provide the venue for Group D action also between the 25th of February and the 3rd of March. Team Wellington will embark on their fourth Champions League campaign and the men from the New Zealand capital will be hoping to go one better after failing at the last hurdle to finish runners-up to Auckland City FC in the past three years. 2005 runners-up AS Magenta from New Caledonia have a rich pedigree at this level with seven previous appearances. In 2017, the Numia based club finished top of Group B with three wins from three matches to set up a semi-final with Team Wellington. Following a two-all draw in their opening leg, the New Caledonians suffered a 7-1 defeat in New Zealand. OFC Champions League qualifier runners-up Lupe Olasonga can take plenty of positives from their 2017 Champions League group stage performances. Last year the Samoans only lost to Magenta 2-1, before another narrow 4-3 defeat against Madang FC, and finally a 3-0 defeat to Tahiti Central Sport. Marist FC from the Solomon Islands will also fancy their chances to progress to the quarterfinals in what will be the club's fifth OFC club tournament. In 2017, they finished the group stage second behind A.S. Stefana following a win, a draw and a loss. The top two teams from each group will progress to the knockout stage. Next, we'll meet a rising star of America's NFL football who still remembers his strong Pacific soccer roots. Being back and uh, I was able to make it to one of the games, you know, watch the boys play. I think they have a lot of potential in them, you know, to grow as a soccer player and even that as men, you know, because I know um, there's some young players on the team and um, I think they're not ready to be on that level yet, you know, so just for them being here and for the uh, uh, American Sign War Association, um, keep building the clubs here and stuff like that, we'll let them grow, make them grow as like one of the best players, you know, to play soccer. But they'll grow to be one of the best players here on the island, so. Oh, well, I grew up with uh, two brothers, three sisters, uh, with both parents in my life, and then uh, I was born here in American Samoa. I left high school without a scholarship, so um, I went with the uh, under-19 World Championship game to in Texas. So we had an American Samoa football team, went to Texas and played and play there. And then I've decided to uh, stay in the States to play football and to continue school. And then uh, I played there for two years. Then after that, I found out I was eligible to move on to the university. Then I got a scholarship to Washington State and I was able to go there and uh, take my skills to the next level and my ed education to the next level. But then, uh, it all went from there, you know. The 221st pick in the 2017 NFL Draft, the Oakland Raiders select Shalom Luani, safety, Washington State. After two years at Washington State, I got drafted to the Oakland Raiders. It was a blessing, you know. I was a blessed to be given an opportunity to play in the next level. So that's one of the main questions they've asked me every time I get an interview is how do you um, brought soccer into football and I just told them that soccer gave me footwork so like the drills they've given me it helped me um, 
be able to move quickly and fast. So yes, it's a big time uh, helpful. My most memorable moment was when I scored the first goal against Togman in the World Cup qualifying appeal. It was nothing. Yeah, I scored, I scored the first goal, but then that was like the first, you know, the most memorable moment is that first goal because, I don't know, it, it makes me feel like, you know, I did something for this, you know, association, so. And also being a, the youngest player on the team, you know, it's, it makes me feel special to, to play, especially with like the older guys, the big guys, you know, and be able to compete with them. So it was, it was awesome. Well, um, I know I had a long journey, but it, I had no plans after high school. And I've always believed that it was all God's plan. You know, all I did was believe in it and trust it, you know, and just keep it going. I've always wanted to be on that team where you've proven people that we're not just an underrated team, you know. I wanted to be on the team where we're building to go forward instead of backwards. So hopefully in the next couple of years, you know, American Samoa soccer team will be like way in the front there than what people are expecting. So yes, I really do miss playing soccer, but I can't afford to risk it. Injury, so that's why I'm just being patient. There's a lot of talent and it's up to them. You know, you can't just talk about it, you know, it's gotta be about it. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, just keep grinding, keep putting in work, because nothing comes out handed to you, you know, you just gotta take it, you know, and just, just gotta be passionate about it and you gotta love it. Well, it's, uh, I'm glad my first year as a rookie, you know, it's been done with, and uh, I've learned a lot about being a pro now. It's all business, don't take anything serious, you know, because if, if you're expecting people to treat you like a baby, you know, you can't get nothing from it. So you gotta expect the worst from it, you know, so just gotta be positive about it, you know, and just keep moving on and learn from your mistakes and stuff. So. I would say back then, yeah, soccer was one of the big sports that I've always wanted to play, you know, but now I've, um, successful football player, so I don't think I could ever think back, but I kind of miss it, to be honest. Jaya Sailua was another footballer who played in American Samoa, so strike qualifying win over Tonga in 2011. In that match, Jaya has created another piece of football history by becoming the first ever transgendered player to take the pitch at a FIFA-sanctioned World Cup qualifier. These days, I haven't been uh, involved a lot with the sport, um, only because I've been focusing a lot on my transition. Living in Hawaii, uh, they're not very, they're not as accepting uh, in the sports realm of fafafine and of transgenders. And so, um, I guess it was the lack of confidence to play and the lack of opportunity to play. It was hard for me to find a team that would. Um, allow me to play the way I am. And so slowly I've been drifting from the sport, um, but since I moved home in November, um, being comfortable with the people and knowing that I am accepted here by uh, my people and the culture, um, I feel like I need to be more involved and get involved with uh, de the developmental efforts of the local soccer association and seeing the rate of development that they've put forth so far since 2011, since I last played with the national team, um, it's very inspirational. Soccer has a very special place in my heart. Um, it was the first sport that I played um, when I was 11, and it's the kind of sport that um, I want to be a part of. And um, not only is it fun, but it has given me a lot of opportunity, both local and internationally. I love that American Samoa is hosting more and more international uh, competition. It's evidence of the development efforts of the Football Federation of American Samoa, um, how passionate they are and how dedicated they are to uh, developing uh, soccer locally. It's good too for the community to see um, 
teams from other countries come in and I guess the sport is being more appreciated within the Samoan community, the American Samoan community. During the games on Saturday, there were a lot more people who came out to see the, the games um, from when we played. <laughs> so the interest has grown um, from the grassroots level and it's just nice to see um, the Football Federation of American Sam hosting more international matches and yeah, it's, ins it, it's inspiring. I think my dream for the association is the same as everyone's dream um, in their respective countries is to see um, American Samoa uh, reach um, the World Cup. Eventually, I feel like it could happen, but for sure it would not be in my generation. I went into 2011 knowing that this could possibly, that that team could possibly be the team that could change the dynamic of soccer here in American Samoa. Um, of course, we didn't know how the other team, teams would be, um, how well they would play, or how, how competitive they would be, um, but as long as we tried our best and uh, we were there to do what we came to do, I think just knowing that we were there to represent American Samoa the best we could was the best that we could do. And um, winning that first game, uh, I think changed the reputation, not only the reputation, but how soccer was um, perceived here in American Samoa and how we were perceived in the Pacific region. Um, we, in 90 minutes, we became a competitor, a legitimate competitor in the Pacific region. And um, I think 2011 was the uh, turning point of um, the way that we um, sought to develop soccer here in American Samoa. Um, I had a lot of pride in that game personally because um, it was my first time starting. Um, also personally because um, after that match I was named the first transgender in the world to play in a FIFA World Cup sanctioned tournament and I didn't go into that game wanting that title. You know? Um, the responsibilities that came with it afterwards were um, a bit overwhelming simply because I, I'm not an advocate, I'm not an, an activist, I'm simply a soccer player and I, was, um, I went into it doing what I wanted to do, playing the sport that I love to play and it just so happened that no other transgender in the world has played in a FIFA sanctioned tournament um, and to, to know that that a first in the world has come from such a tiny uh, Pacific island in the Pacific region. Um, I mean, the OFC is uh, the smallest um, confederation in FIFA, and to have that sort of progress come from our region is, uh, I think, is a very good sign of um, how open-minded the Pacific region is, and I think the rest of the world can learn a lot from our region. I understand that a lot of Pacific countries in the Pacific region are similar um, culture-wise uh, when it comes to um, their uh, respective transgender communities. And so um, the acceptance is there, the respect is there in a lot of Pacific Island cultures. Um, what needs to happen is um, from the Fafafine and respective transgender communities around the Pacific region is they need to understand that there are opportunities out there and um, so long as they stay true to their passions of playing whatever sport it is that they want to play and knowing that they have uh, the whole region to back them. I was not only proud that someone from Oceania was asked to be um, a jury member of the first and the second FIFA Diversity Award um, and to see the um, progress that FIFA as an organization, as a, as a world organization, um, to see the progress that they're um, trying to make in terms of anti-discrimination and um, evident in this award, the FIFA Diversity Award, uh, celebrating organizations around the world that 
um, help to fight discrimination of all sorts. And then to have FIFA ask uh, a transgender person to sit on a jury of only 11, 11 members from all over the region, or all over the world. Um, it made me proud to be from the Pacific region, but it also made me proud to be a Fafafine, and it made me proud to be a part of a sport that is finally um, celebrating diversity. And so I like to see a lot, of, a lot more uh, representation of the third gender in the Pacific region. And finally today, let's meet New Zealand assistant referee Hayden Tutbury, who was called upon to assist in a mid-air medical emergency on his flight to the 2018 OC Champions League qualifiers. So, for leaving Auckland um, and heading to Samoa um, on the flight there, um, about an hour into the flight, uh, there's a, a announcement over the intercom um, saying is there any doctors um, or medical, medically trained staff um, on the flight? and I could see the guy, he was sitting to my right, about three or four seats up. Um, so I basically put my hand up and said, um, oh, what, what do you need? And they said, oh, we think this guy's having a heart attack or we're not quite sure. Um, so we, we need a doctor and I said, well, I'm not a doctor, but I'm medically trained. Um, so I said, well, I can, I can just loan some assistance. Uh, so what happened was I took his uh, blood pressure and his pulse. Uh, and work with the staff in New Zealand to relay that information down to a doctor in Auckland. Um, so we relayed with that um, and a nurse came as well. So uh, we had myself and a nurse um, sit with this, with this gentleman um, and yeah, we basically just monitored him and the doctor um, then relayed what we should do. Uh, so we gave him some um, spray uh, as well as some, uh, some of his heart medication uh, to make sure that we got the heart um, attack under control. Uh, he was feeling quite numb down the arm, chest pains, uh, so it was quite indicative of a heart attack. Uh, so yeah, so just learned some assistance and any of the staff are really good. Luckily we had the um, option to relay to a doctor, otherwise they said we could have turned around because we're an hour from uh, Auckland and about an hour and a half from Apia, so we weren't we were basically right in the middle when he started having a heart attack. Uh, so luckily uh, we could calm the situation down and, and carry on with our flight. Um, but no, it didn't affect my preparation at all. No, I don't, well, I don't think I'm a hero. I think I was just at, at the right place at the right time and, and I could see the guy um, and saw that no doctors were on the plane so I just put my hand up and, and as I said, the New Zealand staff were, were very appreciative and they're actually very good. They sat with the, with the guy for the last two and a half hours of the flight um, rotating the staff, um, so the New Zealand staff were, were very good um, in terms of what they did. They got the oxygen um, and, and the right medical sort of advice, which is exactly what you want. And that's our program for now, but join us again next month for more stories from the world of Oceania football. Goodbye for now.